Uh, for those of you who are new to responsible day trading or anything to the likes of that, uh, my name is Lindsay Duff. I am the founder and owner here at Responsible Day Trading, and I also am uh, one of the founders and the CEO of You Profit Trader. So we're definitely um, all about trading around here. And one of the things that um, you know was always asked of me is, what do we do about taxes? And honestly, guys, uh, at that time, we would just kind of push everybody off and say, you know, speak to your tax person. And um, then we would kind of leave these open-ended questions. And well, Jay and I crossed paths and he has helped kind of <laughs> close that out and um, be able to give us a little bit more information. So um, I have been in the day trading industry for about 15 years. Uh, Jay, you've been like five, I think. Yeah, close to, yeah. yeah. About five years with Jay. And Jay kind of went through the same thing. Jay went through, hey, I don't know what to do with my taxes. What should I be doing? And then he got a little bit more involved and made all of our lives a little bit easier here. <laughs> so um, so what I'm going to do is hand it over to Jay and let him tell you a little bit about more about himself. And then we can get it kicked off here in just a moment. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today. As she said, I was dabbling in day trading and I triggered a couple of things called a wash sale. And I had no idea what I had done and started looking into it. And I realized that the tax code when it comes to day traders, it's a whole new world. It's a completely different planet. And people make assumptions all the time about how their taxes are going to turn out. For example, if you're taking coaching or training, people assume that that's going to be deductible, just like any other expense you might face for any other type of sole proprietorship. And it's just not true. And so a lot of people think, you know, if you paid a lot of money for coaching or for indicator fees or for those kind of things, and you're sitting there thinking you can deduct those against your investments, you can't. And there are a lot of other ways that you can get yourself in trouble day trading. And so I started to gain a real passion for this, realizing that there's a lot of misinformation out there. And so I dove in head first and have been a tax advisor ever since. I came on board with Responsible Day Trading Tax Pros because I want to help people and save you a lot of money, a lot of heartache, and get rid of any red flags when it comes to day trading, because there are red flags that you're going to want to avoid. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I, um, I myself have only been involved with futures day trading, e-mini futures for most of my day trading career. I did, however, uh, find myself involved in some stocks. And I also triggered a wash sale, sale rule, which I had no clue about. And um, I reached out to the company that I was trading through. and was like, what is this? Why are you charging more than the, than the stock was even at when I purchased? And it turns out it doesn't work the same as futures. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, you may have some questions that come to specifics for futures or for stocks. And, you know, we can try and get most of those answered here today. If we can't, we can always set up, you can always set up some time to talk with Jay and I'll drop the link in so y'all can see his link. So you can set up a one-on-one -on -one to speak with him. It's 30 minutes. It's usually 20, 20 minutes, minutes, but we can minutes. go 30 if yeah. you need it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you get a 20 minute consultation with them for free that will kind of cover any questions you have and things like that as well. So um, without further ado, I guess, does anybody have any questions before we kick off? Everybody good so far? I just want to make sure everybody can hear. Everybody's good. I saw Dwight say he could hear good. He could hear just fine. Yes. Okay. Dwight's still with me. All right. All right, All right guys. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and get this party started. All right. Oh, can you allow me to share my screen? I absolutely can. There you go. All right. Can everybody see that? 
Uh, I can see it. Yes. You okay, guys can see that. Okay. Good. All right. So first of all, uh, I want to let everybody know, and this is very important that what you're about to hear is general tax information. This is not specific advice. It is for instructional purposes only. As Lindsay pointed out, um, we have a free 20 minute consultation. And let me tell you, it's not a sales call. We'll talk about your specific circumstances and you can schedule that consultation just by scanning that QR code, or you can go to responsibledaytradingtaxpros.com and you can schedule for there. But please, please, please know that I cannot speak to your specific, uh, your specific situation today. But I can speak, we'll talk about uh, stock traders, we'll talk a little bit about crypto, we'll talk about Forex, we'll talk about watch sales, all of those things. And Lindsay will be watching the questions. So before we move on to another section, if she sees a question about what we're talking about, then uh, she will stop and, and answer or ask me those questions. And if I can answer them in this forum, I will. Uh, if not, we'll have to do it when you have your tax consultation. So let's, I mentioned that you can't deduct things against your investments like coaching, internet uh, costs, home office, uh, anything like that. If you are considered just a normal investor. And in fact, when you are a normal investor and, and you want to convert over to day trading, there's several things that you want to change to, to avoid red flags and to get the best possible tax treatment. So what I want to do first is explain to you how the IRS looks at you as an investor and how you can change that to get the best possible tax treatment. So as an investor, there are three obstacles that most day traders and swing traders want to change. The first is that you can't deduct business expenses, as I said, so home office, internet, computer equipment, indicator fees, all of those things are not deductible if the IRS considers you an investor. The second is that you are subject to the wash sale rule. We will dive into the wash sale rule in more detail later on in this presentation. Uh, you will walk away with a good understanding of wash sales and how to avoid them. And the third is the $3,000 loss limitation. If you're considered an investor and you lose $20,000 uh, on uh, trading, the most you can deduct of that towards other income is $3,000 and you have to carry forward the rest. And I have to tell you, the two things that generate the most calls for me are wash sales, and the $3,000 loss limitation. There are steps that you need to take ahead of time to uh, get rid of these rules. If you don't and suddenly have a huge loss or you get your end of your statement from the IRS and there's a large number of wash sales disallowed, there is nothing you can do at that point. There is no going backwards. That's why it's important that you understand this information now so that you can be proactive and so that you're not calling me saying, how do I fix this problem? Because I can't help you after the fact. So that's very important. So the other thing that's important to know is that as an investor, you are taxed at the normal capital gains rate. And there's two capital gains rate. There's a long-term rate and there's a short-term rate. So the long-term rate is anything that you hold for over a year. So if you buy a security and you're in it for 13 months and then you sell it, you will be subject to the long-term tax rate, which is uh, capped at 20%. In fact, there's only three levels of the long-term tax rate, 0%, 15%, or 20%. That's as high as it goes. So if you ever find yourself in a situation where you've had the stock for 11 months and you're thinking about selling it, if you can hold on for one more month, you're going to save tremendous amounts of money uh, for capital gains. But if you can't, and most traders don't, most traders are you know in and out on the same day, 
or if you're doing other types of trading, maybe a couple of weeks, but not holding for over a year. So in that case, you're subject to the short-term tax rate. The short-term tax rate obviously is anything you hold for under one year. And that basically is the same tax as whatever income bracket you are in. It caps out at 37%, but that's the highest bracket. So this is what investor status looks like. You can't deduct business expenses. You're subject to the wash sale rule. You can't deduct more than 3,000 towards other income and you are taxed at either long-term or short-term. Now, this changes a little bit if you're a futures or Forex trader and we will, we will delineate that also coming up in the presentation. All right, so there's two paths available for you to overcome investor status. And we'll talk about each of these because those three obstacles, you can't just get rid of them by doing one thing. So path number one is to qualify for something called trader tax status. You might also hear of this referred to as active trader status. So if you qualify for trader tax status, and I'll tell you what those qualifications are in a minute, and then you do something called a mark to market election, which we will also dive into, that will take care of all three obstacles. Path number two is to trade under an LLC or an S Corp and make the mark to market election on top of that LLC or S Corp. And again, I'm going to share with you what these terms mean. I just want you to see on the screen what these two paths are, and we'll take a minute and talk about each path. So path number one is if you're an individual and you don't want to set up a trading business, but you want to get business uh, deductions and you want to eliminate wash sales and you want to get rid of that $3,000 loss limitation, the way you accomplish that as an individual the first thing you have to do is qualify for trader tax status. Now, I will tell you that this is like a mysterious part of the tax code. And if you go online and you start searching for trader tax status, you're going to get a thousand different answers about what it is and how to get it. So I want to I want to set that record straight. Everything I'm about to tell you, believe it or not, is not written in the tax code. It's actually uh, as a result of court cases where people have sued the IRS to get trader tax status and judges decided what the guidelines should be. So you won't find this anywhere in the tax code, uh, believe it or not. And that's one of the reasons why you want an accountant who understands trader taxes. So the first thing you have to do, as I said, is qualify for trader tax status. That allows you to take business deductions you can qualify for trader tax status at the end of the year. And an important note, and this is very hard to determine when you're doing internet, internet research, is that the mark to market is different than trader tax status. They're two completely different things. A lot of people or most people, when they call me, they think they are the same thing. They are not. So the only thing trader tax status gives you is the ability to take business deductions. That's it. So how do you qualify for trader tax status? Well, here they are. You have to have an average of four hours per day of trading. That includes research time. 720 trades per year. They want you daily trading. And basically that means trading 70% of the work days of the year. And uh, they also want the majority of your trades under uh, or within a 30-day window. They also, and this is something they're getting more, uh, more direct with or looking for more, is they want it to be a primary source of income. And that's perhaps the most difficult part of achieving trader tax status. But if you meet these guidelines, then at the end of the year, there's no form to fill out for trader tax status. If you think you qualify, then you put your deductions on a Schedule C and you cross your fingers and you hope because you can't know if you qualify really until after the IRS sees your documentation. 
if they have questions about whether or not you qualify for trader tax status, then they will reach out to you and they'll ask for more documentation. The other part about trader tax status is you have to qualify or requalify for it every single year. So it's not like once you achieve trader tax status, you're in the club and you get to stay in that club. And one of the things that is frustrating about this is I see traders who near the end of the year start making trades, not because they are good trades, not because the indicators tell them it's time to initiate a trade, but they start doing trades because they haven't made 720 trades. And so they want to make sure that they return, tra they retain trader tax status. Um, so that's not a good way to go. That's why I'm not really a fan of seeking trader tax status as an individual. And just so you know, that 720 trades, that uh, is for when you enter the position, that is one trade. And when you exit the position, that is another trade. So uh, it's, uh, it's more like uh, 360 round trips is, round a, trip, is a way yeah. to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any comments on that, Lindsay? I don't. Everybody seems to be good right now. All I right. Yeah, I was yeah. just I was just let putting that in there. You know, some people look at that and it's like, you know, when you're looking at your um commissions, you know, figuring that out round trip, mm -hmm. well, you got to figure that think about that with this too, you know. So yeah, exactly right. Okay, so that's path number one. Let's talk about path number two. Path number two is to bring all of your trading into an LLC or an S corporation. If you do this correctly, and there are some pitfalls with this, um, which is why we recommend that you have a, a trader tax professional set up your entity because you need to be a qualifying day trading entity. And believe it or not, there are specific tax rules if you want to be a day trading entity. But so let's talk about this path. Uh, LLC. LLC or limited liability company is the most basic structure. It requires a business tax return, but it's considered a pass-through entity. One of the common questions I get from people is, uh, what about double taxation? Doesn't my business get taxed first and then I get taxed uh, as well? No, the LLC is considered a pass-through entity. What that means is the LLC doesn't pay any taxes directly. What happens is you file your business tax return and you figure out your net profit or loss, which is typically gains minus losses minus deductions. That equals your net profit or loss. That net profit or loss is passed on to your individual income tax, and that's where it gets paid. So if you made 20 grand uh, trading, that 20,000 gets transferred to your personal income tax and it increases your taxable gain by $20,000. By the same token, if it's a loss, then that loss reduces your taxable income by whatever that amount is. And this is this final odd item here is important. I talk to a lot of people who think that they don't have to pay taxes on the money if it stays in their brokerage account. So they feel like they're only taxed when they take the money out. That's not that's not the case. Sorry to tell you, um, the you are taxed when when you close the position. That is a taxable event. Now you figure out your overall net gain or loss at the end of the year. So it will again be gains minus losses. But whatever you show as a net gain or loss, you will be taxed on that. So that's a common mistake that I see. Let's talk about the S corporation. Also, it's a pass-through entity. Now you're required to put yourself on the payroll with an S corporation. And that means that on top of your capital gains tax, you're also gonna be paying the self-employment tax. That's the social security, the FICA, all of that on what you pay yourself in payroll. And you're probably asking, Jay, why would I want to do that in an S corporation? Well, the S corporation, the minute you start putting yourself on the payroll, other options open up to you. So you can make contributions to IRAs and 401ks. 
you can set up a self-directed or an SCP IRA, and you can put up to $58,000 per year pre-tax into that vehicle. Uh, normal IRAs, you can only, I think the current max is 7,000 per year. Um, and I actually think I need to update this, Lindsay. I think it went up to 61,000 per year. Okay. I do have that. one question from Tom yes. Jenkins that came in and it says, this doesn't apply to a uh, Roth 401k. Yeah, so a Roth is uh, is very different. So a Roth, so uh, an SCP IRA or an IRA in a 401k, those are pre-tax dollars, right? So they'll be deducted from your payroll and it's pre-tax. And then anything that grows in that IRA will also be taxed. You're not, you don't, you don't pay that tax till when you withdraw it in retirement. If you take it out early, there are penalties. So that's pre-tax. A Roth is post-tax. So you've already taken the money out. You've already paid taxes on it. You put that in your Roth and everything in your Roth grows tax-free. So I have traders that trade, they, they mirror their trades in the real world on their regular brokerage. They mirror those in their Roth and because everything in the Roth grows tax-free. When you take it out, you don't pay tax on any of those gains. You are limited to your annual contribution to a Roth. But I also know people that only trade in their Roth because they're trading for, for their retirement or whatever. And so they pay no tax on that growth, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. So great question. The is other it, thing you can do- He is just said, can, I, I have a solo 401k with Roth with Roth option. Yeah, yeah. So in that situation, you can trade within your Roth and everything in that Roth grows tax-free. You can also, uh, with an S-Corp, when you're on the payroll, you can deduct health insurance premiums. You can set up health savings accounts as well. Typically, we recommend when you go down the S-Corp route that uh, if you're not making eighty dollars to $100,000 a year, the the benefits aren't really there because you have to run a payroll. There are expenses with that. There are added annual fees to an S corporation. One of the things that I always recommend is the, the S corp is really good if you've left your day job, if you don't have W-2 income and you want to replace some of those benefits that you would get from your W-2 job, like 401ks, like health savings accounts and those kind of things. So if you don't need those things, then I wouldn't go into an S corporation. You can upgrade or, or change your LLC to be taxed as an S corp later on. So a lot of our traders will start with the LLC and then as they grow, they will eventually move over to the S corporation. Any other questions on that? Why I take a drink? My mouth is dry. Um, let's see. Do, okay, so that's why Peter Thiel's Roth IRA is five billion. <laughs> okay, uh, does the LLC have to be multiple members, or can a single member to take advantage of tax deductions and avoid yeah, the wash a, rule? That's a great question. So, hang on. Let me go back here. Um. One of the keys, and I think this comes up later on in the presentation, one of the important things to remember is that a single member LLC is viewed by the IRS as a sole proprietor. And sole proprietor day traders have to qualify for trader tax status if they want business deductions. So it needs to be a multi-member LLC or a single member S corporation to be a qualifying day trading entity. Also, please remember that all of the things we're talking about right now are only to get you business deductions. We haven't talked about mark to market. Your Whether or not you are a, a sole proprietor with trader tax status or a multi-member LLC or an S corporation, that does not impact your wash sales. So your type of entity that you are does not change wash sales. That is achieved in a different way. So remember, trader tax status, having a multi-member LLC, or having an S corporation does not change wash sales, and it does not change the $3,000 loss limitation. 
that's another step that you have to add on top of your individual trader tax status or your LLC or your S corporation. And again, we'll talk about the mark to market election here coming up. Okay. All right. So once we've achieved business uh, status to where we can take deductions by either qualifying for trader tax status as an individual or setting up a multi-member LLC or single member S corp, now it's time to start talking about the mark to market election. Here are the benefits of the mark to market election. It eliminates the wash sale rule, which if you are a stock and options trader, that is so nice. Um, it allows for unlimited net loss deductions in a single year. So the $3,000 loss limitation also disappears. And the mark to market election can be made on top of your trader tax status or your trading entity. Now, let's talk about the requirements for mark to market. This is where people get tripped up. So as an individual, first, you have to qualify for trader tax status in order to get the mark to market election. And to get the mark to market election, you have to do it in advance. Unlike trader tax status, which you could do at the end of the year, the mark to market election, you have to make that election by the tax deadline of the uh, previous year. So for example, if you wanted mark to market for 2022, you would have had to file it with your 2021 taxes by April 18th of 2022. Now, if you do that, you get the mark to market election for all of 2022 and then moving forward. So uh, again, you have to make it in advance. And, and there's again, there's not a form here. If you search on the internet, they're going to tell you that there is a specific form that you fill out. That is misinformation. It's actually a letter. You can handwrite it. You can type it up and you put it with your tax return and you say you're electing mark to market uh, accounting on either your individual status or on uh, your LLC or your S corporation. The other thing, because you got to love the IRS, is sometimes they will send you a letter saying they've received it and they've approved it. Other times you won't. And so uh, it's just the fun of, of the IRS, right? Um, but that's how you get it as an individual. If you want it on your LLC or your S corporation, then it's the deadline changes and you can make it within 75 days of setting up the new entity. So if you started your trading LLC today, you could start it with the mark to market election and you will not have to have wash sales or you and the loss, uh, the loss limitation. I'm going to take another drink here. Okay, so with, uh, okay, let me back up here one second. Uh, with the LLC or the S corporation, uh, there's no form to send to the IRS, believe it or not. It's just an internal memo that you add to your meeting notes saying we're electing the mark-to-market -mark election on our LLC. And that's it. You just you just tell yourself that you're going to use the uh, mark to market accounting, um, and then after your first year with mark to market, there is a special form that you have to uh, you have to do with your tax return. It's called a three one one five, and basically what's happening when you make the mark to market election, and this is very important is that you're telling the IRS that you're going to operate on a cash basis. What that means is that at the end of the year, you're going to uh, close out all your positions on paper, and you're going to pay taxes on any unrealized gains. If you're a day trader, typically, or a swing trader, you're not going to be holding positions. So that's no big deal. You're closing out on a regular basis. But if you do, I have traders who, who do their day trading, but they also have long-term positions. Well, if you have those long-term positions, you're going to have to pay taxes on them, whether you close the position out or not. 
So one of the most common ways to avoid that is you trade all your long-term positions under your own name. And then, uh, hang on, I'm going to admit somebody. And then you set up your <laughs> LLC or your entity. You put mark to market on that entity and you do all your short-term trades in that entity. And that's the way you get separation. And that's the way you can have long-term positions and short-term positions. You just put them in two different places. So I hope that makes sense. Okay. Any other so, questions? Yes. Um, so I've actually got a couple. Okay. Um, so we've got what does mark to market look like without TTS or an S uh, in an S corp? No other requirements. Uh, you can't you can't take mark to market if you as an individual if you don't qualify for trader tax status, and uh, to have an LLC you can't. There's no way to get mark to market outside of trader tax status or um, over on top of an LLC or an S-Corp. Does that answer the question, do you think? I think so. Um, yeah. There's another one that came in too. Uh, if the letter is not submitted within 75 days, then I should create a new LLC. Also, uh, is there a way to confirm that IRS received the mark to market election? Two very good questions. So the first one is, uh, if you if you don't if you didn't get the uh, mark to market election in by the tax deadline, a lot of people think that they can file an extension and that that will apply to the mark to market. That's not true. There is no forgiveness uh, unless you can say that you paid somebody to make the mark to market and they didn't. Um, so as an individual, you've got to make it on the tax deadline. If you didn't make it by the tax deadline, yes, you can set up your LLC. You don't have to send anything to the IRS. Uh, once you've set up your LLC, you're just supposed to have the documentation in your entity within 75 days of creating your entity that says you're electing the mark to market election. And then on your first year tax return, whether or not you're an individual or a business, you will file this form and it's a complicated form called the 3115. And that's where you will go through all of your positions and you'll zero them out on paper and you'll figure out what your what your tax is. I hope that answers that question. Well, I know that Lenny said that her question got answered about the TTS and S Corp. Dwight Great. is good. He says, yes, thank you. That was the oh, question right. about the 75 days LLC. And, yeah. And, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So quick Hang on here. Quick review. As an investor, you can't deduct business expenses. So the way to overcome that is you qualify for trader tax status as an individual, or you set up a trading entity, an LLC or an S corporation. The LLC has to be a multi-member. And just so you know, people always ask me about multi-member. I should tell you the most common structure is a husband and wife. That works great. Uh, but I have people who put uh, siblings on the LLC, they put children on the LLC, or a business partner. Um, so, but again, the most common is a husband and wife. Then, uh, if you're subject to the washout rule, and you are as an investor, you can make the mark to market election, and learn how wash sales work and how to avoid them. Now, I don't remember if I have this coming up or not. Um, actually, I know I do. So we'll wait. We're going to go in a little bit more detail on wash sales, what they are and how you can avoid them, even if you don't have the mark to market election. Um, so that's the other thing. If you haven't made it for this year, there's still a way around wash sales. And I'll explain that to you. And then the third obstacle with investor status is the 3000 per year uh, net loss deduction. The mark to market election eliminates that. So these are basically the three uh, most wanted things by day traders. And these are the things that generate all the calls that come to me on a regular basis. So any other questions on that? I do not see any so far. Okay. Well, let's talk about this strange beast <laughs> called a wash sale. Um, this is the one where you can get in the most trouble. So uh, very important to pay attention to this. Um, what triggers a wash sale? 
A wash sale is when you sell a security at a loss and you buy it back again within 30 days. If you do this, you have triggered a wash sale. Now, um, I, people are like, what is this law? What, what is this? Why does the IRS do this? Basically, what happened is uh, investors would sell uh, their stocks for a loss at the end of the tax year, so like on December 31st, so that they could get the tax benefit of a loss because the way you calculate your, your net gain or loss is your gains minus your losses minus your deductions equals your net gain or loss. Well, if you can show a huge loss at the end of the year because you're selling losses, then uh, why wouldn't you do it? It's called uh, tax harvesting, right? Well, the problem is the IRS noticed that people would sell those stocks for a loss on the last day of the year, and then the very next day they would buy them back. So it was like gamesmanship in order to reduce your, your tax burden. So the IRS said, we don't like that. So we're going to call that a wash sale rule. And if you, uh, buy, if you sell for a loss and you buy back within 30 days, then you trigger a wash sale. What does that mean? When you trigger a loss, uh, wash sale, sorry, the loss is disallowed and added to the cost basis of the next purchase. Losses continue to carry over until you are out of the security for at least 30 days. So what happens is at the end of the year, they take the total number of wash sales that you have, and you can't use those losses against your gains. So in essence, those losses disappear. So if you have uh, $30,000, $40,000 in wash sales, then what happens is whatever your gain, your actual gain is, your actual taxable gain, it's going to be increased by the number or the dollar amount of the wash sales that you have. So in essence, you end up paying taxes on $40,000 that you didn't make. You actually lost it. And this can, this can be devastating. I spoke to a lady just two weeks ago. She had $700,000 in wash sales, if you can believe that. I spoke to a man two days ago who has $300,000 in wash sales. I know I can I mean, hear luckily, you. luckily we don't deal. I mean, you know, like I said, I'm mostly in, in E-minis and futures. So mm -hmm. we don't deal with wash sales very much. But when you don't know about it and you yeah. get yourself sucked into that kind of thing, that's the problem right there. That's why we're here today, you know? Yeah. I Absolutely. And this was what really frustrates me, Lindsay, is that there's no there's no requirement by brokerages to tell you that you just triggered a wash sale. It will show up on your statement. You'll see a little W next to certain trades. But what does that mean? If you know, if I I think that a brokerage should be required the minute you trigger your first wash sale to let you know, hey, you just triggered a wash sale. Here's what that means. Get some accounting advice, right? Because it's so easy to trade nowadays. You have platforms that let you trade for free. Everybody and their dog became a day trader during the pandemic. None of them knew about wash sales and there's no mechanism built in to teach them about those. So that's the number one call that I get is people freaking out about wash sales. And because you have to do the mark-to-market -mark election in advance, there's no way to go backwards. And that's what they want. Um, so there are some ways to deal with this, as I said, if you don't have the mark-to-market -mark election. So how do you avoid wash sales? Well, the first we talked about is to make the mark-to-market -mark election. The second is, remember, if you look down here in the bottom left of this slide, losses continue to carry over until you are out of the security for at least 30 days. So anytime during the year you're out of that position that has wash sales, if you're out of it for 30 days, then that wash sale becomes disallowed. So I have traders that do not have the mark-to-market -mark election. And what they will do is they know where their wash sales are. And on the last day of the year, December 31st, they will sell all of the stocks that have wash sales accumulated throughout the year. They will stay out of those positions until February 1st. What happens when you do that is all of the wash sales are 
they're allowed in that previous tax year now because you got out of them and you stayed out of them for 30 days. Then I have traders who don't know the rule and they they trade their wash sale positions in early January. And what that does is it drags all of your wash sale losses into the next year. So that's what you want to avoid. As it says here, otherwise the losses tied up in wash sales will carry over to the next year. So it can even out if you, if you have wash sales this year and you have to pay additional tax on them, but you get out of them next year for at least 30 days, then those wash sales should reconcile over time. But it's a big deal if, you know, what most of these people I talk to, they don't have a way to pay this tax bill because of their wash sales. So it's no comfort to them that they will reconcile in the next year. They're like, how do I get through this year? And they're basically have to put themselves under the mercy of the IRS, hope they can get on a payment plan or something until those wash sales reconcile. Um, and uh, let me see if I have it here. Okay, futures, Forex, index options, um, they do not have wash sales. Crypto does not have wash sales. And one of the other things that I will tell you is that you can use capital losses against capital gains. So what that means is you can do this, for example, if you have crypto. So if you have a loss with crypto, that's a capital loss, you can use that loss towards any other types of capital gains. So if you have stock capital gains, if you have real estate capital gains, you can, if your crypto is down, you can sell that loss that that harvests that loss that you can use against other capital gains. And then you can buy back crypto the very next day because when the wash sale rules were written, there was no such thing as cryptocurrency. So the laws have not caught up to crypto. This is something that people will use to reduce their, their tax bill. The laws will catch up with crypto, just so you know. <laughs> so I don't yeah, know how they catch soon up that... with everything. Don't yeah, they? <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised they haven't done it already. I think that it's just because of the gridlock that exists in Washington D.C. Yeah. So it's coming eventually. Any questions on that, Lindsay? No, sir. We're good. All right. Uh, you mentioned that uh, futures does not have wash sales. Forex index options does not have wash sales. Um, the other important thing to note, and this is where people lose a lot of money, they end up paying more money to the IRS than they're supposed to, which is a crime to me. Um, the uh, futures and Forex are taxed at a different rate. They're not taxed at the long-term rate or the short-term rate. They are taxed as what's called a 1256 contract. This is one of the most important reasons, if you're a future or Forex traders, that you want an accountant. Remember, accountant fees are tax deductible. So this is going to pay for itself. Uh, a 12, Remember, I told you before that a long-term capital gains is maxed out at 20%. Short-term capital gains maxes out at 37%. One is if you hold for over a year. The other is if you hold for under a year. A 1256 contract actually gets what's called a blended tax rate. What that means is 60% will be taxed at the long-term rate, which caps out at 20%, and 40% will be taxed at the long-term rate, which is whatever tax bracket you're in. This, if you're in the highest bracket, this can reduce your, uh, your taxes down from 37% all the way down to 28% if you're in the tax top tax bracket. Now, can you imagine if you don't know about that and you're paying uh, almost 10% to the IRS more than you should have to? And also because of this, I know people who only trade futures or who only trade Forex because of the better tax rate. I mean, it's just instant you know, an instant savings. So if you know how to trade futures or Forex, just be aware that these 1256 contracts are taxed at a much better rate. So that's very cool when you know about it. Um, I talked to somebody the other day, he didn't know about it. He's been trading futures for seven years, I think he said, and had no idea. 
So for seven years, he's been paying more tax than he should, and he's in the top tier of uh, income. So he's been paying 10% more. And so he can go back and do an amended tax return, but he can only back, go back three years. So he's got four years of paying the uh, short-term tax rate and paying more to the IRS. And again, that just puts a tear in my eye. I cry a little bit for people in that scenario. Any other, oh, so let's see what I have. Uh, oh, okay, this is very important. One of the things that the mark-to-market election does is it converts capital gains to ordinary income. The reason that that's important to know is remember I said you can use capital losses against other capital gains. If you do the mark-to-market election, you no longer make capital gains. It's all considered earned income. So that means you can't offset that. You can offset $3,000 a year, but you can't offset it against other types of income. If you do the mark-to-market election, you can, but when it comes to futures, Forex, and index options, or 1256 contracts, if you make the mark-to-market election and you no longer have capital gains, then guess what happens to your blended tax rate? It disappears. So futures traders have to make a decision of what's most important for them. Is it the blended tax rate? You don't have to worry about wash sales. So really the only other benefit you get is a $3,000 loss limitation. So what's more important to you? The $3,000 loss limitation or the potential tax savings of the 1256 contracts and the blended tax rate? I will tell you, most of our futures traders choose not to do the mark-to-market election because of, because of this loss of the blended tax rate. So that's something very important. I will tell you that it is really specific to your situation. This is one of the reasons that we offer the tax consultation because we're talking in very broad general sense right now. If you have, uh, if you're trading stocks and options and futures, but you're trading 70% stocks and options and 30% futures, then yeah, maybe you want to make the mark-to-market election. Or if you're 100% futures or 90% futures, maybe you don't. The other thing you could do, and I see this, is have two separate entities. One entity does uh, does uh, stocks and options with, uh, with the mark-to-market. The other entity does futures. So it really depends upon your situation. Uh, so you need to be aware of this. The other thing is, once again, I told you that capital losses can be offset with cap future capital gains. So if you have a $40,000 capital loss this year and you make $40,000 in capital gains next year, you basically have $40,000 in losses kind of in the bank, so to speak, that you can offset those future capital gains. But remember, if you make the mark-to-market election, you no longer have capital gains. So you won't have a future capital gain to offset your capital loss. I hope that this makes sense. So for people who have a large capital loss carry forward, we also recommend they don't make the mark-to-market election until they have exhausted that capital loss carryover. Otherwise, it disappears. And so that's a very important consideration as well. Any other questions on this? There is one more question. And then um, I think that that's about wraps it up after that, right? Because yeah. almost one o'clock. Okay, so does paying yourself a dividend on S Corp reduce your FICA contribution? So a dividend on an S Corp is still taxed, I believe at the capital gains rate. So that there is no there is no self-employment tax on the capital gains. The only self-employment tax that you will pay in an S Corp is, is based upon your payroll. So it's whatever you decide to pay yourself. So um so and then that becomes an expense to the business. So if you if you made a, if you made a hundred thousand dollars and you pay yourself $50,000, then that gets deducted. Remember, gains minus losses minus expenses. 
that 50,000 gets deducted from your overall expenses. So what's left will be $50,000, right? Because you paid yourself 50,000 in payroll, you paid a self-employment tax on that. What is left is all treated as capital gains. So um, if it's 1256, then it will be paid at the blended tax rate. If it's uh, stocks or options, then it will be paid or crypto, then it will be paid at either the long-term or the short-term rate. I hope that answered the question. And if it didn't, let's have a tax consultation. Yeah, and, for sure. Yeah. And I did put the link in there and it's also right here if you wanna scan this so that you can get together. Guys, I want to fully apologize for if there was any confusion about the, the time. It was absolutely my fault. I will make sure that that <laughs> does not happen again. Um, we're going to piece together the two recordings because as soon as we close out here, it should start rendering the recording. If you'll just send me that, then I'll yep. put them together and put them out for everybody. Um, but that is going to wrap it up. I'm sorry, I do have another commitment in about five minutes. So I have to run as quickly as possible. But um, guys, if you have questions, you can reach out to us at responsibledaytrading.com or head on to responsibledaytradingtaxpros.com sign up there. Like I said, I dropped it in here so you can sign up on Jay's Calendly. Uh, will you send out Jay's information by email? You can reach it through that Calendly and be able to connect with him. Yeah, that's the best way to get me. I do uh, I do 12 tax consultations a day. So uh, that's the best way to reach me. Get on the calendar. Calling me directly or emailing is at least for the initial steps, not the best way to get me. Get on my schedule. Okay. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jay, for the amazing information. So glad to do it. I appreciate it. And, um, you know, hopefully everybody got what they needed out of today. And if not, they can reach out to you and get some more. So, and we're going to do right. this again uh, yes, very yeah. soon. So, definitely. All right, guys. Everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you for being here. And uh, we'll catch up with y'all soon. All right. Thanks, bye. everybody. <laughs> Thank you.